Good morning, dear students. My name is Farhan Mazhar, and today is the twenty um, fourth of April, two thousand and twenty one. The day is Saturday, and right now I am with the eleven chemistry class. And the subject we are studying is physics five zero five four. And today we have set our hearts to solve uh, October November two thousand twenty two two paper. This paper is a theory paper. We call it paper two, and this paper belongs from the zone two. The zone two papers are also available in the red spot. You can also solve them from there. But I, I am also trying to explain these questions to you. So in this session, in this video, we are going to attempt the section B of the October November 2020. Let's start this paper. So uh, the first question coming on your screen. So this is October November and 2020. The paper is two two. A bus leaves a bus stop at time t equals to zero and travel along a horizontal road until it reaches a second bus stop. Figure seven point one is the distance time graph for the bus between t equals to zero and t equals to sixty. So here you have a distance time graph, and remember, in the distance time graph, the gradient of the graph is equals to the speed of the bus. So, for example. If you look at here, here the gradient and it is a it's a graph is a curve, and it's an increasing curve. So it means that the speed of the car, uh, the bus is increasing. Here the gradient has become constant, which means that the speed is constant. Here the gradient is gradually decreasing, which means that the bus is decelerating. The speed of the bus is decreasing. Here the graph, the distance time graph, has become flat. Which means the gradient is zero, which means the speed is zero, which means the bus is uh, stationary. So let's start uh, today's paper. Uh, first question: The road on which the bus is traveling is straight, except for a short curved section. So when it's traveling, there is a curved path also, a short curved section. So where is the there is a curve? So the bus travels around this circular curve between t twenty one and t twenty four seconds. So from T twenty one, from T twenty one, from from here somewhere, from here, till T twenty four. So that's T twenty four, till this point. The bus is moving in a curve, in a curve, in a circular path. So don't forget this thing. Underline this on your hard copy of the paper. Highlight this thing. It's a very important information. Describe how the motion of the bus between t equals to zero and t equals to ten seconds differ from its motion between t thirty five and t forty seconds. Okay, so let's zero to ten second and thirty five to forty seconds. So have a have a good look on these questions. Let me increase the size so you can see the whole thing. Okay, from zero to ten second, you see the graph is uh, is a curve and it's uh, curving upward. So its its slope is gradually increasing. So it means that the bus was um, accelerating. The bus speed was increasing, and whatever the speed it got it got after that, the speed has become constant because the gradient is constant. So it took zero to ten second to get that maximum speed. So the bus is accelerating from zero to ten. Now look at here what happened when the when the time is forty. When the time is from thirty five to forty. Let me. I just want to show. Let me increase it. From thirty five to forty. From thirty five to forty. You see here. This is somewhere thirty five. This is thirty five. And this is forty. So here the curve is decreasing. The gradient of the curve is decreasing. When the distance time graph its curve is decreasing, its its its, 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 its gradient is decreasing. It means that the car is slowing down. And at the forty second, it 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 its speed becomes zero. So whatever was the maximum speed with which the car the bus was traveling, after thirty five the speed decreased, and at forty the bus was at rest. So it means it lost that speed, whatever was the speed, it, in five seconds. It reached that speed by increasing the speed in ten seconds. But here it has 
from that maximum speed, it has gone to zero speed in just five seconds. So from 35 to 40, the speed is basically uh, decreasing, it's decelerating, but this deceleration value will be larger because the time in 10 seconds, it gained that speed from rest. And in five seconds, it lost that speed and came to rest. So it means that the value of the deceleration will be larger. Okay, so uh, the first question was of three marks. Uh, he says, uh, describe how the motion of the bus between t equals to zero and t equals to 10 seconds differs from its motion between t equals to 35 seconds and t is equals to 40 seconds. So let me show you my work. I have done this also. So let me size. Let me do. Okay. <clears throat> Question number seven, A part uh, from T zero to T 10 speed is increasing non-uniform. From T 35 to T 40, speed is decreasing non-uniform. In uh, first portion, speed was achieved in 10 seconds, but in second portion, speed was lost in five seconds. So acceleration in the T zero to 10 is smaller than the deceleration in the T 35. So the deceleration when produced when the time was 35 to 40, that will be larger. The acceleration produced from the, when the time was zero to 10, uh, the acceleration is smaller. So I hope that you have understood this and let me, let me check the, show you the marking scheme first. And here we go, the marking scheme. So we have that B part uh, showing up. Uh, question number seven, A part between T0 and T10 second, it is accelerating or speed velocity increasing. Between T35 seconds and T40 seconds, it is decelerating or speed velocity decreasing. Magnitude the, of the acceleration less than the magnitude of the deceleration, or you can say between T0 and T10 start from rest, zero speed, or between T35 and 35 millisecond and t 40 second it finishes this is where we don't have the millisecond okay by mistake written millisecond so t 40 second it finishes at rest with the zero speed so it's a three mark question and we have answered it and you can also write your answers and this is the marking scheme i hope you will be able to describe the motion of the bus between the specified times okay so let's go to the next question the next question is coming so it's the question number seven, B part. He says, uh, determine the maximum speed of the bus during these 60 seconds. So the maximum speed of the bus during these 60 seconds is, this is the maximum speed, because that's the maximum gradient the bus has got. So I will find out what is the gradient of the line here. So this process is very simple. What I will do, I will take two points here. For example, I will choose this point, I will choose this point, I will note down their coordinates, and I will apply the formula of the gradient, that is y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1, and I will be able to find out the gradient, and that gradient is equal to the speed, and that is the maximum, because the maximum slope of this graph is right here. This is here, okay? And till this point, 35, after 10 to 35, the gradient is same. same. So you take any point between time 10 to time uh, 35 and the gradient will be same. So let me show you how I have done this. So you're on your screen and uh, the, the, I have taken two points, 20 comma one, 180 and 30 comma 300 and I apply the formula of the gradient that is y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1 d2 minus d1 divided by d2 minus d1 that's 300 minus 180 divided by 30 minus 20 equals to 120 divided by 10 and that will be 12 meter per second so the gradient is 12 meter per second and that gradient of the distance time graph is equal to the speed so I hope that you have understood this numerical let's check what's the marking scheme has to say and the marking scheme is saying that, uh, yeah, question number B is showing two pairs of coordinates from the straight line section and appropriate division using candidates coordinates. And the answer can be from 11.7 to 12 meter per second. Our answer came out to be 12 meter per second. 
So hopefully you have understood this. This was the B part, question number seven, B first part. Okay, so let's move to the next question and that will be uh, B second part. He says the B, we, we are done with the B first part, now we are on the B second part. He says the average speed of, of the bus between leaving the first bus stop and arriving at the second bus stop. Underline this word. The average speed of the bus between leaving the first bus stop and arriving at the second bus stop. When he arrived at the second bus stop, let me take you to the graph. So here he left the first bus stop and here he has reached the second bus stop. So the time, time duration is how much? 40. The total time taken for this journey is 40. And how much is the distance traveled? That is something like uh, 390, 390 meters. And it took 40 seconds. So the average speed is total distance traveled by total time taken. But the important thing is he said when he arrived at the second bus stop. So that time is 40. So I have done this. Let me show you my work. And, and then we can move on. And here we go. Okay, so the average speed is equal to the total distance divided by the total time taken. The total distance from the graph I know is 390 meter and the time taken from first bus stop to the second bus stop. When he arrived at the second bus stop, that was 40 seconds. So it will be 39 by four, 39 by four, that's 9.75, 9.75 meter per second. And because here the three significant figures are involved, but the data which is given to me that has only one significant figure, so I will round it off. Uh, that has two significant figures, so I will round it off. So the final answer will be 10 meter per second. And I hope that you have understood this numerical. Let, let, let's check the marking scheme. What the marking scheme has to say, the marking scheme question says 9.7 to 10 meter per second. So our answer is perfect. So let's move to the next question. And the next question is, we are done with the, this uh, second part. Now we are on the C part. The C part says, uh, the question is, let me show you this. It says, state how velocity differs from the speed. The difference between the velocity and the speed is, uh, you see the speed is, uh, speed is uh, uh, a scalar quantity, whereas the vector uh, velocity is a vector quantity. So velocity has magnitude and direction but the speed only has magnitude. So it means that the velocity has direction, which the speed do not have. So that's the difference between the velocity and the speed. Then he says there are three points during the 60 second when there is a non-zero resultant force acting on the bus. So there is a non-zero resultant force acting on the bus during these three periods. Complete the statement to indicate these three time periods and state the direction of the resultant force in that period. So uh, the first portion will be that portion in which the graph, so you see the graph was a curve. So between T equals to, uh, T equals to, uh, T equals to zero to T equals to 10. And the, because the bus accelerated, so it means that the direction of that resultant force was along the direction of the motion. From T zero to T 10, the bus, the bus was accelerating. Whenever an object speed increases, it means that the resultant force acting on that object is in the direction of its motion. So then from T21 to T24, he, he told us actually that the bus was traveling in a curved path. Whenever you move in a circular path, in a curved path, the resultant, and but during 21 to 24 seconds, you see the speed is constant. If you look at the graph, the speed is constant, it means that the direction of the resultant force is towards the center of that curved path. And the motion of the bus in the curved path is always tangential. It is to in the direction of the tangent at any moment, uh, uh, tangent to that curved path. So the resultant force direction will be perpendicular to the direction of the motion. So from 21 second to 24 second, the direction of the resultant force is perpendicular to the direction of the motion. And the last portion, third part will be from T35 to 40 second. You can see the graph is a curve, it's acceleration, it's gradient is gradually decreasing. 
which means that the, the bus is slowing down, its velocity or its speed is decreasing. It means that there is a resultant force whenever the, the bus or the car or any object which is slowing down, it means that the resultant force direction is opposite to the direction of its motion. So when the resultant force is opposite to the direction of the motion, the, it, it acts like brakes. It, it decelerates the, uh, the object, it, it slows down the object. So these are the three parts. It's, it's a new question and it's very, uh, you can say it's quite tricky. Um, I think most of the students will be able to tell the first portion and the last portion, the first and the third portion, because they are the graphs were curves. So obviously it was very simple to identify that they here the resultant force is acting in the first portion 10 to five to uh, zero to 10 seconds because the, the bus was accelerating. So it's simple that the direction of the resultant force is along the uh, parallel to the direction of the motion. And in the last portion where, where the time is from 35 seconds to 40 seconds, the bus is slowing down, it's decelerating. So here very easily, and the graph is a curve and very easily the student can recognize this. But the, uh, that, that is decelerating from 35 seconds to 40 seconds. And whenever an object will decelerate, the direction of the, of, the, of the resultant force will be opposite to the motion. That's why it's slowing down. And but the, the the middle question, which is uh, option uh, question number two, here the option number two, question number two or part number two. In that, you know, uh, he told us in a short sentence that from twenty one to twenty four second, the result, the car, the bus was on a curved path. So when the bus was on the curved path, the resultant force will be uh, towards the uh, towards the center of that curved path. But the bus is moving in in tangential way, and so the direction of the resultant force and the motion of the bus are perpendicular to each other. So it's a brand new question. So hopefully you have understood this. Uh, I have written this answer as well. Let me show you. So let me let's check my answers, and then we will see the markings. Okay, so the velocity has direction as well as magnitude. Speed only has magnitude. So that was the first part. So question number seven, C, second part, T0 and T10. The direction of the resultant force is along the direction of the motion. From T21 and T24, the direction of the resultant force is perpendicular to the direction of the motion. From T35 to T40, the direction of the resultant force is opposite to the direction of the motion. So uh, hopefully you have understood this and let's check what the marking scheme has to say about these parts and here on your screen, they are showing up, I think. Okay, so <clears throat> the velocity as a direction, uh, it, its velocity has a direction or is a vector sort of depends upon displacement rather than distance. Seven C second part answer needs not to be in this order. 10, 1, 0, and 10 seconds and for, forwards in direction of motion movement. 2 to 2, two seconds, from 0 to 10 seconds and forward in the direction of motion. The second may, uh, will be 21 seconds and 24 seconds perpendicular to the motion to the direction of the movement. And the third one is 35 seconds and 40 seconds and backwards opposite to the direction of the movement. I have tried my best to explain you these three options. Why are we, why are we writing what we are writing? So hopefully you have understood. So let's move to the next question. And the next question is, he says, uh, yeah, here we go. He says, during the journey, the air resistance acting on the bus varies. State why the air resistance changes during the journey. The air resistance depends, this is the, the stiff force that depends on the speed, one very important factor on which the air resistance depends is the speed of the bus. If the bus is slowing down, the air resistance will decrease. If the bus is uh, speeding up, its air resistance will gradually increase also. So it depends upon the speed. The, the, the air resistance during the whole journey is increasing, decreasing, varying. The reason is because the speed of the bus is also not constant throughout the journey, it's varying. So uh, the speed was changing, that's why the air resistance was also changing. So let's check what the marking scheme has to say. I have written this answer also. So air, let me show you my answer. So air resistance depends upon speed of object, speed of bus is changing throughout its journey. 
throughout this journey, the speed of the bus was changing. Sometimes it slowed down, sometimes it increased, with, then with constant speed. So you see the speed was changing. That's why the air resistance acting on the bus is also changing. So uh, let's uh, move to the next part. Okay, so let's, we will check the marking scheme. Okay, speed of bus varies, changes, or decreases, increases. That's why the air resistance is changing. So seven D first part the marking scheme is showing on the screen. Okay, so let's go back to the question. Next question, next question. He says, on the figure 7.1, mark and label with an M a time when the air resistance is a maximum value. Throughout every factory, same, same, throughout the journey because same bus, same surface area. But the one difference is that at every moment, the speed was different. So when will be the air resistance maximum? When the speed is maximum. So I have done this. When, when, the, when the speed was maximum, let me show you. So you can see here I've tried to. From this point till this point, kind of this point, yeah, the speed was constant and it was maximum. And so during, uh, during this portion, put anywhere the point and write it, write M, maximum value. So here you have to write a M. Speed is maximum, so air resistance is also maximum at this point. You can put a point here, you can put a point here, you can put a point here, and don't forget to put an M with it, okay? That is given in the question, you put a M, M for maximum. So hopefully you have understood. So let me show you the marking scene, so that's it. Any time on the figure 1.1 from 10 seconds to 35 seconds, labeled M. So put an M, it's a must, okay? So, okay, so this was the question number seven. Now we will move to the question number eight. So here we go. Question number eight is showing up on your screen. A thin converging lens, converging lens means convex lens, is made of a transparent material of the refractive index 1.4. A ray of light traveling in air strikes the surface of the lens at an angle of incidence of 55 degrees. Calculate the angle of refraction. You see, I know the angle of incidence in the air, which is the, which is the rare medium. And I know the refractive index, that's 1.4. And they want me to calculate the angle of refraction, you know, the Snell's law, Snell's law says N equals to sine I by sine R, where N stands for the refractive index, which is given 1.4, sine I, the sine of the angle of incidence, and angle of incidence given that's 55, and sine R, we want to find out the value of the R. So N equals to sine I divided by sine R. So I've done this paper, uh, this on a paper, let me show you my work, and then we will see So here you have question number eight, A first part. So N is equals to sine I by sine R, 1.4 equals to sine 55 divided by sine R. So sine R will be equals to sine 55 divided by 1.4. So just enter this in the calculator. So you will get 0 0.5851. Shift sine, I will bring the sine to the other side to become sine inverse on the calculator. Shift sine 0 0.5851 equals to. And that will be 35.8 degrees, approximately 36 degrees. So the angle of the refraction will be approximately 36 degrees. So I hope you have understood this equation on the Snell's law. So let's check the marking scheme if our answers are good. So question number eight and it's the first part, that's 36 degrees is the answer. So our answer is perfect. So let's move to the next question. And the next question is, <clears throat> Okay, he wants you to, uh, he says place a tick in one of the boxes in the third column of table 8.1 to indicate how the ray, light ray deviate and what happens to the speed of the light in the ray as it enters the lens. Okay, so uh, remember this thing, these are some facts, you should remember these things. She says uh, that actually whenever, the light will uh, bend away from the north. The speed is supposed to increase. Whenever the light deviates 
away from the normal, the speed will increase when this happens. This happens when the light is entering from glass into air. Remember, when the light enters from a dense medium into a rare medium, the light will bend away from the normal. And the speed of the light in the rare medium is always faster. So when the light will bend away from the normal, uh, the speed will increase because this is when the light enters from glass into air, from dense medium into rare medium. The speed increases and the light deviates away from the normal. So here, this is the option. Okay, so when the light bends towards the normal, when, when this happens, when the light bends towards normal, the light bends towards normal when the light enters from air into glass. When the light enters from a rare medium into a dense medium, when the light enters from air into glass, the light bends towards normal. And when the light bends towards normal, its speed decreases because the speed of the, of the light in the glass is slow. So when the light will enter from, uh, from the, from, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 air into the glass, it will bend towards normal, its speed will decrease. So I think this is the option. So the two things, put a tick here and put a tick here. I have done this on a paper. Let me show you that. So it's very simple. So on your screen, now you can see, hopefully, here we have, uh, I have put the two ticks. Uh, when the light moves away from the normal, it means the light is entering from a dense medium into a rare medium, like from glass into air, and the speed will increase. And towards the normal decreases, I put it there because when the light enters from a rare medium into dense medium, for example, from air into glass, it bends towards the normal and the speed decreases. So hopefully you have understood this question. And let's move to the next part. Let's check the marking scheme also. So, so I will, I will, I will. Okay, now the next part is state what happens to the frequency of the light in the ray as, as it enters the glass. You see, when the light enters from one medium to another medium, the, fre the frequency of the light do not change. In our course, especially the frequency of the light do not change. When you will study uh, air levels physics, then you will study that the speed, the velocity, the frequency might be able to, the frequency changes. But in our course, the frequency will not change. Okay, the focal length of the lens is 2.5 centimeter. What is meant by a focal length? You know, the focal length means along the principal axis. Remember, along the principal axis, the distance from the optical center to the principal focus. The distance between the optical center of the lens to the principal focus, along the principal axis, that distance is known as the focal length. So it's a definition, never forget this. So I think I have written these answers. Let me show you my answers and then we will move on. And here we go. Next question. Okay, frequency will remain unchanged. That was the question number eight, a third part. Question number eight, B, sec first part is distance between optical center and the principal focus along the principal axis is called the focal length. Never, never forget this definition, a very famous definition frequently asked in the papers of the code. Okay, so let's check the marking scheme what the marking scheme has to say. And our answer is right, stays constant. Distance between focal point, principal focus, and the spelling of the principal, I wrote as L-E, but the right spellings are P-A-L. Okay, so don't make this spelling mistake. So I hope that you have understood this. So let's move to the next question. The next question is, okay. So here we have a graph. Let me reduce the size so you can see it. It's too much small. Okay. So by drawing on the figure 8.1, locate and mark the image one of I of the O. So here is the object given, here is the lens given. I know the focal length, the focal length is given. That is 2.5. And these five small squares are equals to one centimeter. 
So I will mark, you see how you will mark. If you have your hard copy with you, I will also show I have drawn this. Um, this is the optical center of the lens. This is representing basically the lens. Here is we have the object. From here, count uh, how much? 12 small squares. Go to the right, 12 small squares and put a dot and write F. And also from the optical center, go 12 uh, small squares to the left and put a dot and write F. Then once you have done by writing F here and F on both the sides, uh, by, by, I mean, uh, locating where is the focal, principal focus on both the sides of the lens. You see how you locate the image. The process is very simple. Try to understand and then I will show you. I have also drawn this. You start from the head of the object. You move parallel to the principal axis. And when you reach the uh, lens from here, you will pass the ray from the F on the right side. And second ray, you start from the top of the head of the object and you pass it through the optical center. This is the optical center. And undeviate, we do not deviate, go straight, no deviation. Where these two rays will intersect, that will be the tip of the image. So I can, I can show you, I've done this already on the paper. Let me show you. So here we go. Uh, this is the question number eight. Let me show you. Let me increase the size also. So you can see the whole thing. So hopefully you can see uh, here from here, I have counted 12 small squares because the, the, the focal length is 2.5 centimeter, centimeter and 2.5 centimeter in this way. So I, I started the first ray, green color ray from here. And then I passed it to the app on the other side, on the right side, this, this green color thing. And then I started the second ray from the top of the object. And I passed it through the optical center. It went undeviated, this blue color line. I'm changing the colors just for your understanding. So where these two lines intersected, that is the point where we will have the head of the object in the image. So here I will have the image. So this color is showing image. I have put I with it to show that this is the image. So I will put a small arrow here to show this. You can see this image is diminished. This image is real. This image is inverted. Hopefully you have understood this, how we have located the image on that diagram. The next question is, he wants you to determine the distance of I from the lens and calculate the magnitude uh, sorry, magnification of O produced by the lens. Okay, so uh, let me show you first of all. The distance of the image, you just count how many squares are there and how much is this distance? Because this is made on a graph and this is a horizontal distance, so very easily you can count this. So this will be the distance of the image from the lens. Also count, that is one part, and then he said, find out the magnification. The formula for the linear magnification, there are two formulas. One is the distance of the image from the lens. You just check what is this distance and divide it with the distance of the object from the lens. Divide it with this distance. You will get the magnification. Another way of finding the magnification is the height of the image by this height divided by height of the object. So there are two ways of finding the magnification. One is the distance of the image from the lens divided by the distance of the object from the lens. And the other way is by finding the distance of the, uh, you know, sorry, the height of the image by the height of the object. That is right. Both ways you will get the same answer. It's up to you what you want. So here we have uh, that question. Now, distance is equals to 3.5 centimeter. I have done this and the magnification will be 3.5 divided by nine equals to 0 0.39. So our answer is 0 0.39, okay? So let's check the marking scheme, what the marking scheme has to say. It says, uh, here you go, the magnification is from 0 0.37 to 0 0.4. So our answer is in the range of whatever he said. And the distance he said is 3.5, 3.4 to 3.5 centimeters. So our answers are right. Okay, so let's move to the question number eight, C part, he says, uh, Describe, he says, 
That's the next question. This is the question number three. He says, uh, we are done with this part and now it's three part. He said, describe how a converging lens is used in a camera. You see in the camera, we have a converging lens and what that converging lens do, if the, the light rays which are coming from the object, the, the, they pass through the converging lens and that, that converging lens focus them on the photographic film or the photoelectric sensors which are in the camera. So, and the image is formed on that uh, photographic film. The image formed is uh, real, image formed is diminished, image, image formed is uh, inverted. So, uh, and if you are looking at an object which is far away or which object is near, so you can uh, move the camera in most of the, uh, in most of the cameras, the, 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 the Converging, the converging lens or convex lens can be moved. It can be moved out, it can be moved in. So by moving out or moving in, what we do, we focus the image on the photographic film. So let me show you my answer and then we will see what the marking scheme says about this answer. This answer is coming on your screen now. Converging lens is used in, in camera to make real and diminished objects of an ob any object on the photograph film. This word I have written that that word should be image. Uh, converging lens is used in camera to make real and diminished image of an object, of any object on the photographic film or on digital light detector. Lens can be moved out or in to focus that. Okay. So I hope that uh, these words are clear to you. This word here, this word is not object. This word is supposed to be image. Diminished image of any object. Okay, so let's check the marking scheme. What the marking scheme has to say. The marking scheme says uh, question number eight, and it is part number. It is part number C. It's a three mark question, and he says any three from light from the subject object focus refracted by the lens by moving, sliding, adjusting lens, real image formed on digital light detector film. So we have put all these three points in our answer. So hopefully we will get the three points. So uh, <clears throat> let me show you the marks are given. This simply said three. Three marks, three points you have to write. Okay, so we are moving to the next question. And now the next question is coming on the screen. Here we go. We have to reduce the size so you can see the whole thing. So here we have the next question. It says, figure 9.1 shows a permanent magnet lying on a piece of paper. So here we have a table. On the table, we have fixed a white paper. And in the middle of the white paper, we have put a, a permanent magnet, uh, you know, magnet. Uh, underline the material in the list from which it is possible to make a strong permanent magnet. Strong permanent magnets are made by the steel. So you will underline the steel here. Steel, and steel underline the steel. Steel makes is used to make the permanent magnets. Describe an experiment to plot pattern and the direction of the magnitude, magnetic field surrounding the magnet. You may draw on the figure 9.1 if you wish. So it's very simple. What I will do, this is a famous experiment. So we will do that. Okay. So here we go. A very famous experiment. It says uh, question number nine, a part. So we have a permanent magnet. We have placed it on a paper. We will take a magnetic compass and we will put it near the North Pole. So wherever the pointer of the magnetic compass will point, I will put a dot on the paper where the pointer is pointing and I will put a dot on paper where the tail of that pointer is. Then I will put the, uh, I will put the magnetic, I will pick the magnetic compass and I will put it in front of that, the second dot which I have drawn. And uh, I will put it in such a way that the tail of the pointer of the magnetic compass will be coinciding with that second dot. And then wherever the pointer of the magnetic compass will point, I will put a dot there. Then I will pick the magnetic compass again and I will put it in front of the last dot uh, in such a way that the back of the pointer is towards that dot. And wherever the pointer is pointing, I'll put a dot. And I will continue this process until I will reach the south. So you see, then I will have dots uh, which are starting from the north pole and they are ending at the south pole. 
and I can join them with a smooth term. You can join them with a curve. So then I will start again from a different location near the North Pole and I will continue this process until I reach the South Pole. In the same way, I will get the dots and then I will join those dots. So this is how you will draw the magnetic field pattern around a, around a permanent magnet with the help of the magnetic compass. So I've written this answer. I've tried to write, write this, uh, this, 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 this uh, experiment. Take a magnetic compass, put it near North Pole of a bar magnet, put the dot on paper coinciding with the tail and head of the pointer of the magnetic compass. Put the magnetic compass ahead of the second dot in such a way that the tail of the pointer is with the second dot. Continue this process until you reach the South Pole. Then join dots with each other. Do the same process starting from a different location near the North Pole. So in this way, you will be able to get the magnetic lines around the permanent magnet. So let's check what the marking scheme has to say about this. So uh, he says steel underlined and no other material indicated. Okay, so that was the first part. Second part is uh, it's a four mark question. Uh, in the one mark is for uh, saying that use of the plotting compass. And one mark is for telling that place the plotting compass on the paper next to the magnet and mark a dot where the compass needle points. And one mark for telling that the move compass other end of the needle next to the dot and mark a dot where the compass needle points. And one mark is for telling that continue and, and the needle points in the direction of the magnetic field. So this was the question number nine, B part. And let's go to the next question. So the next question on your screen is, Question number 9.2, it says, shows the north pole of a magnet placed in front of a south pole of a second uh, magnet, a section of the horizontal metal wire JK. This is that wire JK lies uh, in the magnetic field between the two magnet magnetic poles and K of the metal wire is connected to the positive uh, terminal of the battery and, and J is connected to the negative terminal of the battery. Explain. He says, explain in terms of electrons why there is a current, the wire and straight the direction of the conventional current. You see, uh, because uh, electrons, electrons have charges and the electrons, they will be moving from the negative terminal of the battery to the positive terminal of the battery. So the charges are flowing in the wire. And whenever the charge will flow, we say the current is flowing. And the second part of this question is, what is the direction of the conventional current here? The direction of the... Conventional current always flows from the positive terminal towards the negative terminal. So the, the, the conventional current will flow from K to J, but the electron flow will be from J to K. But the conventional current will be from K to J, from positive to negative. I've written this answer. Let me show it's, it's you. It's a two mark question. And let me show you my answer real quick. Here we go. He says that the electrons, uh, let's increase the size. Electrons have negative charge when they move, charge is moved, so it is called current. Electrons move from negative terminal of the battery towards the positive terminal of the battery. Conventional current flows from the positive terminal towards the negative terminal of the battery from K towards J. So in the given diagram, it will be from K to J. So let's move to the next question. We will check the markings later. Okay, so he says the part of the JK that is in the, in the magnetic field experience of force, state the direction of the F and describe how this method is deduced. So you see here we have that, uh, and let's talk about the conventional current because the method we use that depends upon the conventional current. The conventional current is from, flowing from the K to J, which means from right to left. The magnetic field is from north to south, uh, away from me. And uh, I can tell what is the direction of the force experienced by this, uh, this wire. And we can tell this by the using the Fleming's left hand rule. Fleming's left hand rule says that if you take your left hand, stretch the fingers of the left hand, these three fingers, with thumb and the index finger and the middle finger, you stretch them in such a way that they are perpendicular to each other like this, I'm showing you. And uh, the thumb will be the force and the uh, index finger will be the, magnet, uh, the magnetic field and C will be the direction of the conventional current. 
So if I apply here, you see the magnetic, uh, the current is going, the conventional current is going from K to J. The north to south, the magnetic field is from north to south. Then my thumb is pointing downward. It means that this K and J will experience a force in the downward direction. So how do I know this direction? By applying the Fleming's left-hand rule. And I am also described so it's, it's a four mark question. Uh, let's, let me show you my answer. I've written this answer. So what the answer is, I have stretch the thumb, index finger, and the middle finger of your left hand such a way that they are perpendicular to each other. They are mutually perpendicular. If the index finger is uh, from north to south, it means the index finger is in the direction of the, of the magnetic field. And, uh, and middle finger is in the direction of the conventional current. Thumb will be in the direction of the force experienced by the conductor. Thumb in this case will point towards the top of the page. So let me check again. I, I, I have written here top of the page. Let me check this wording again, whether this will be towards the top of the page or not. Okay, so the current is flowing from the, the magnetic field is from north to south. The current is flowing from K to J and my thumb is pointing downward. So I think that the force should be in the downward direction. Here, by mistake, I've written upward, the top of the page, and you can change this thumb is, in this case, will point towards the bottom of the page. Let me correct this mistake. This is not towards the top of the page. It's towards the bottom of the page. You can apply the left-hand rule yourself, and you will see that the thumb will be pointing in towards the bottom of the page. So let's check the marking scheme. I have I have, I have I have mentioned a mistake here. It should be bottom of the page. So let's check the marking scheme. What the marking scheme has to be. <clears throat> this is uh, uh, 9C first part. Free electrons attracted to K positive terminal or repelled by J negative terminal. Conventional current from K to J. Fleming's left hand rule mentioned or the equivalent rule mentioned, magnetic field relate, related to index pointer finger, equivalent or current related to middle finger, equivalent thumb points down the page. I, I told you this, uh, I by mistake, I wrote top of the page is towards the bottom of the page. So this is this, this will get you four marks. And this is another way of writing this. He says a catapult field experience field lines clockwise when viewed from K or anti-clockwise when viewed from J. Extra field lines, stronger field above the wire, fewer field lines, weaker field, below the wire force towards weaker field. This is another way of writing this answer. You see, because that, that current in the wire, and uh, that will have its own magnetic field. And in the, because the current is going like this, so um, uh, above the, that wire, the direction of the permanent magnetic field and the direction of the magnetic field due to the current, they will have the same direction. So there the magnetic field will be stronger. And, and below that wire, the direction of the magnetic field due to the current, that will be opposite to the direction of the permanent magnet and magnetic field of the permanent magnet. So below that wire, below that K and J wire, the magnetic field will be weak and above that the magnetic field will be strong and it is uh, it is a natural phenomenon that the conductor who is carrying current that will move from a point where the magnetic field is stronger towards a point where the magnetic field is weaker so what will happen that jk wire or kj wire will go downward so this is another way of explaining this thing so that's 9C, second part. There are two different ways in which you can explain that answer of four marks. So hopefully you have understood both the ways. So let's, 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 let's go back. And what's the next question? He says, that was eight number question. And here we have, and the question, the equipment in the figure 9.2 is used in a similar experiment. The part of the JK that lies between the poles of a magnet now passes through a long iron tube that is fixed in position. The tube is, is shown in the figure 9.3. So here you that wire K, KJ. So basically that KJ wire is this one, is between the permanent magnets. And now what we have done, we have put a tube over it. And that tube is made of the iron. 
So here in this diagram, he is only showing you that, that we have the tube of the iron and this wire is passing through this. So JK is connected to the battery in the same way as before. State what happens to the force on the wire. Now, because you have a tube of iron around it and you know this is like a ring of iron around that wire and that will be acting like a magnetic shield. It will be acting like a magnetic screen. So no magnetic lines will be able the outside magnetic lines, they will not be able to reach the, 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 the wire K, J. So they will be magnetically shielded. And so obviously there will be no force acting on the J and K. So it's a two mark question. Let me show you my answer. I hope that you have got the point. So here we go. This is the question number nine, C third part. This is iron tube will not, not let magnetic lines come inside the tube it will act as a magnetic shield. So there will be no force on the wire JK. Hopefully you have understood. So let's back to the question. We will check the marking scheme later. Okay, that was a two mark question. And then we have this question. The iron tube and the wire JK are removed. A square vertical coil is placed between the poles so that the plane of the coil lies in the magnetic field as shown in the figure 9.4, he says, explain, explain why the coil tries to rotate when there is a current in the coil, uh, current in the coil. You see when there will be current, uh, so uh, especially when there will be current, so the current will be flowing like this or maybe like this. So this vertical portion of the coil and this vertical side of the this vertical side of the coil and this vertical side of the coil, they are like magnetic, uh, they are like current carrying conductors placed in the magnetic field. They are per placed perpendicular to the magnetic field. So they will experience a force on them. The direction of the force, if I know the direction of the current, I can also tell. But one very important thing, if current is coming from here, so the whatever is the direction of the current in this vertical side of the coil, the current direction in this vertical side of the coil will be opposite to that. The reason is the current came from here. So here the current will be going down, but in this side, the current will going up. So you see in both these vertical portions of those, uh, the sides of the coil, the direction of the current will be automatically opposite to each other. So the force experienced by and the magnetic field and the magnetic field due to the magnetic field here, in both these sides will be opposite to each other. So what? Are, so this force will try to produce a moment, and this will uh, the force will be. For example, the force is in this direction towards the right. The force here will be towards the left. So the forces acting on the vertical sides of this coil, they will be opposite to each other, and due to this, they will produce the same moment. They produce the same moment. Either both of them will be producing the clockwise moment, or both of them will be producing the anti-clockwise moment. So what will happen? The coil will rotate about its axis. It's a two mark question. I hope that I have made, tried to make my point clear. It is the topic of uh, DC motor. So let's check what I have written. And that is, uh, let me increase the size. So this is question number nine and D part. This is current in the coil, vertical side of the coil are current carrying conductors placed perpendicular to the magnetic field. Both will experience force in opposite direction. Direction of current in both vertical side is opposite. So both sides will have turning effect in the same direction. So both of them will have either clockwise or both of them will have either anti-clockwise turning effect. So the coil will rotate about its axis. So let's check the marking scheme. I have not checked the marking scheme. And okay, so this is, so this is question number nine, see the second part, there is no force F or it disappears becomes equal to zero. Wire is magnetically screened or shielded by the iron. It's a two mark question. And then the last part is moments acts on the coil. Forces on vertical sides in opposite direction. One mark for this. And currents in vertical sides is in the opposite direction. So current in both the vertical sides is opposite. If, if in one side, the current is going down, in the other side, it will be going up. If in the here the current is going up, then the, in the other side it will be going down. So the coil becomes X as a magnet or coil produces magnetic field. 
and its face of the coil attracted to the south pole or south face attracted to the north pole. You can write this second. This is one way of explaining. Uh, if you can get you two marks, or you can write it like this. So hopefully the marking scheme is in front of you. So this is that's it. This is one of the question number nine, and this paper if the paper is over. So today, uh, my dear students, we have done. Let me come back to the question. Okay. So this today uh, we have solved uh, uh, October November two thousand and twenty two two paper. And this paper is a theory paper, and this belongs from the zone two. And in this session and this video, we have only solved the section B of this paper. Section A of this paper, I have already solved and uploaded in my YouTube channel. You can find it there. So this paper from the zone two, we have. Uh, so I hope that this has been helpful to you. If this video, this session is helpful to you, don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. And don't forget to share it with your friends. So thank you very much, everybody. And have a good day and God bless you.